All right, and welcome back from that break. Um, I hope you managed to get a cup of tea and managed to grab a toilet break. And also just wanted to, before we move into the first panel, um, reiterate the thanks from Peter McCready uh, to Dr. Milton Love for um, participating in the session. Um, one of at the core principles of NERA and the NDRI is learning as much as we can from other people, other jurisdictions, and pulling through those learnings to inform what we're doing in Australia. And obviously, having people like Milton involved in today's session is um, has been profoundly um, entertaining, but also interesting in terms of what we are trying to learn in Australia. All right, so we have moved to the first panel session. Um, the theme for this is, are artificial structures good or bad for the ecosystem? What are the risks and benefits of full removal? We have five panellists, and I will introduce them one by one. The um, format for this session is a quick five-minute introduction from the three NDRI research leads. So they will briefly talk about the research they're doing under NDRI, and then we'll move towards a more free-flowing discussion. Um, so first off, I'd just like to introduce Dr. Diane McLean from the Australian Institute of Marine Science, DIES. Project is assessing the habitat value of oil and gas infrastructure for fish and other marine organisms. Over to you, Di. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, I'm Di McLean. I'm with, with Ames. Um, I've been a fish ecologist, I suppose, for the past 20 or so years. And um, yeah, for the last you know five or six, I've been really heavily focused my research on the influence of oil and gas structures in marine ecosystems, particularly on fish and fisheries. Um, but the project I'm working on with the NDRI is, as, as Andrew said, assessing the habitat value of oil and gas infrastructure. So the project very much relies on industry ROV inspection video, um, uh, but it also draws on additional data that we've been able to obtain from other sources as well. Uh, so we brought all that together to have a, probably a, the biggest, one of the world's biggest data sets of ROV imagery spatially I think. Um, so we have data for the six, well, we've got six platforms including time series data for one, um, which is not a huge amount of platforms but we have uh, upwards of 60 wells as well surveyed and around 20 pipelines. Um, so we have ecological data for all of those structures now that span the northwest and the southeast of Australia. Um, the projects are looking at three core objectives and we've tackled these kind of in the way of three separate papers so the first one's looking at how the different how the community diversity cover complexity of um, colonizing benthic habitats and also of mobile fish um, sorry fish and mobile invertebrates on these structures um, looking at what influences uh, them being there so how does the different infrastructure types where they are temperature depth all of things what, what's driving the patterns that we're seeing in these communities so that's the first objective um, the second objective is looking at what the habitat value is of structures for valuable fishery species so as Milton talked on also in his um, presentation before there's particular features of structures that will promote the abundance of these species so we're looking at things like what what sections of the platforms are critical what what components of these different wells um, and, you know, how important are the, the, the features we see along pipelines, the spans, the field joints, the concrete mattresses, all of those things um, in that. And the third objective is looking at how the communities on this infrastructure compares to what we're seeing in um, adjacent natural ecosystems. So that's our project. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Di. For, uh, for that introduction. Um, moving right along, I'd like to introduce one of Di's colleagues, Dr. Michelle Tums from the Australian Institute of Marine Science. Uh, Michelle's project is the influence of oil and gas infrastructure on ecological connectivity in the marine ecosystem. So over to you, Michelle. Thanks very much, Andrew. So my area of expertise is the movement behaviour of marine megafauna. And uh, so marine megafauna species like uh, large sharks, turtles and whales. And I use satellite and acoustic telemetry to understand and quantify their movement. 
and also in relation to a range of natural drivers and also in relation to threats. And so um, a lot of my work um, has involved uh, looking at the overlap between some of the species movement and um, oil and gas infrastructure, just in relation to its potential as a threat. Um, but yeah, but I have not been involved in uh, decommissioning um, before now or, or thinking about it. And uh, so my project that I've been leading in the NDRI is on the influence of oil and gas infrastructure on ecological connectivity and marine ecosystems. And, um, and I'll acknowledge my co-leader on this project too, which is Di, who's, um, who's just spoken. And so the, the AIMS uh, team that uh, worked on this project include fish, benthic and marine megafauna ecologists. And we also had subject matter experts in connectivity and oceanography. And so our project uh, reviewed the global state of knowledge um, on the influence of oil and gas infrastructure and ecological connectivity. And uh, included in this, we considered oceanographic processes and level transport, animal movements, invasive species, and also genetic diversity. Our literature review um, started uh, with a, a comprehensive literature search, uh, firstly. And um, we did this not only to identify all the relevant literature, but also to identify all the experts in the field. And, uh, and we invited those experts to be co-authors on this review paper and, and uh, some of those uh, on the panel uh, here with us today. <clears throat> Um, so, as well as um, inviting the experts to be authors on the review paper, we also asked them uh, to give us their opinion on what the key knowledge gaps were in, in this area. And so, our review paper has included this information. Um, and so, identifying these knowledge gaps, we, we're really providing a roadmap for advancing the research forward and to assist uh, with evidence-based uh, decisions. Uh, for decommissioning of oil and gas infrastructure. So our, our draft re review paper is now complete and uh, we're just waiting for sign off uh, to submit that. So, uh, so stand by for that one. And uh, thanks, Andrew. Great, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, the third NDRI researcher in this panel session is Professor Chad Hewitt from Murdoch University. Chad's project is understanding the spread risk of invasive marine species in the context of decommissioning. Uh, Chad, if you could introduce yourself and your project. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm uh, Chad Hewitt. I, I have a background as a marine ecologist, um, but specifically focusing on marine invasions, everything from the ecology through to uh, some of the legislation and, and governance frameworks at national and, and state levels. Um, this project really is to assess the relative risks of the decommissioning scenarios relative to introduced marine species. And really the question becomes which of these various elements is likely to enhance um, the spread and survival of those species um, and expose it to risk at other locations. So much like Michelle identified, we undertook a global systematic review of the primary literature um, to identify um, species with known association to oil and gas structures. Um, we detected about uh, 1,200 articles that um, examined oil and gas or offshore platform structures um, with benthic communities described sufficiently to species level. So we, we needed to understand the species to be able to compare them against a global list of recognized invasions. Um, the current knowledge of global invasions indicates that we have about 2,700 species that have been moved around the world um, across all phyletic groups. And of course, the question is, to what extent do those associate with these offshore structures? Um, from the 1,200 articles, we actually identified only about 32 data sets that were of sufficient um, detail to provide us the ability to collate species lists. Um, we received about 670, 675 species, of which more than 100 have a record of invasion history. Now, mind you, these may not have been introduced in the locations that they were detected, 
but they do have a history of being associated with transport vectors. Um, these species come from 19 phyla, and of those species, 102 of, of the 671 have, have a record of invasion, but more importantly, 51 of those species are already found in Australia. Um, in order to assess the relative risk across those decommissioning scenarios, we've begun looking at species traits that would be associated with those various options um, in order to populate a risk assessment. In that case, we're looking at depth restrictions, um, physiological limitations of individual species, um, time spent in the water column, largely associated with larval reproduction, um, and that includes larval type as well as pelagic larval duration. Um, their light requirements in many instances can be important as well as habitat requirements of those species. In uh, a real quick uh, outcome, 60% of the taxa uh, were restricted largely to shallow waters, less than 50 meters deep, but 15% of, um, of those species could be found greater than 500 meters in depth. And time in the water column, of course, two thirds of the species have relatively short larval durations, which is highly uh, common for introduced species. Those short larval durations are less than five days. However, one third of those species actually had durations greater than 50 days. So from a connectivity perspective, those would remain in the water column for quite some time, oftentimes as planktotrophic or feeding on the plankton um, larvae. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Chad, for that summary of your work. And we just have two more panelists uh, to introduce, although one of, you, one of them you already know, but for now, uh, Professor Ian Sullers from the University of New South Wales. So Ian joins us as one of the representatives on the NDRI Independent Scientific Advisory Board, who has been with us since the very beginning. Um, Ian, if you'd like to say a few words. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I work on biological oceanography and in particular uh, with artificial reefs that are being deployed off the east coast of Australia. I think the ninth one is going in uh, off Batemans Bay uh, next month. I look at everything from the plankton supply to the small forage fish to the predatory fish and ultimately the fishery and quantify that with, with cameras up on the lighthouse. Um, the key to this, this interesting ecosystem uh, is, is really the high vertical relief. So uh, th that's a hear a bit of feedback there, but uh, yeah, I'm just interested in the, in the, in the biological oceanography around uh, artificial reefs. And of course, um, looking at uh, oil and gas infrastructure is, is key to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. And then finally, welcoming back the, the godfather of decommissioning research, Dr. Milton Love. Yeah, <laughs> to be here. Thank you, Milton. All right, so let's move on to this first panel. Thank you everyone for your introductions. Um, look, a fairly potential, I would say easy question, but it's broad enough that it could be maybe not easy. But Di, I might go to you first, but your views on the, you know, this, this question of positive and negative benefit or positive uh, influences, negative influences of, of structures in the ocean. What, what do you think your research is showing? Um, well, considering putting aside the initial installation and the, you know, the, the disturbances associated with that, once you have a structure there, I suppose the negatives would be um, some can facilitate the establishment and spread of invasives. Um, they could alter uh, species behaviour through introducing light and noise um, they can introduce a whole range of nutrients and contaminants into the environment. I suppose those would be the negatives. Um, positives, they obviously provide habitat, opportunities for libel settlement, recruitment. They boost local productivity, as Milton's clearly talked about, increase biomass of fish and other fauna. Um, they also have exclusion zones, so they do act as de facto marine parks, so... They can um, export egg production into surrounding areas. So I suppose those would be some of the, the benefits. Thanks, Di. Um, Chad, I might just leverage off uh, Di's comment about invasives. I mean, thoughts on the role that oil and gas structures in the marine environment are playing in terms of...
You froze there a little bit, Andrew. Uh, finished thoughts. I'll take off on that. Um, the oil and gas structures, um, probably from an invasive species perspective, they're a they're a benthic habitat. They're when they are put in place, they're oftentimes relatively clean habitats, um, and they're uh, they're sufficiently offshore that in many instances, the shallow water um, fauna are transported by human activity. They're brought in with vessels that are um, operationally connecting the coast to the offshore habitats. And um, in many instances, those are, are local. Um, so many of the tenders will come from near shore, but often, oftentimes you'll also have international vessel, vessels coming in. And much like ports and harbors, they provide a, um, a location where these, these novel species can arrive and, and settle. Um, now that said, as Milton indicated in, in his first few slides, these can be incredibly diverse and very uh, significant communities that establish on these platforms. And the likelihood is if you place them in the context of high native species settlement, they may be quite resistant to non-native species arrival and, and uh, persistence. Um, as Di indicated, you know, oftentimes these platforms also are connecting the shallow water to the deep water habitats. And as a consequence, many of these species will potentially have the ability to move down um, and colonize the seafloor, especially that biogenic habitat created by the, the defouling that accu uh, accumulates at the bottom. Chad, just to, I guess, just to dive a little bit into one of your comments there, I guess there's a school of thought around oil and gas infrastructure, decommissioning of these structures, that the presence of invasives within the marine environment is fairly significant already. And so when, if, when you decommission, the increase in risk is probably not likely to change the overall risk profile of invasives in the ocean. I mean, any any observations on that? Yeah, look, um, I think as, as I've indicated, if the species is already present on, on the platform, then the question becomes which of those decommissioning scenarios is, is more likely to spread that, that risk and therefore the potential for impact. Um, clearly, and this sort of gets to, to a question later, but um, if you decommission and you don't do anything, you just leave the platform as it is, the one thing that will happen is there will be a decrease in operational activity and operational transfer with, with vessel movements. Um, it will, however, potentially open it up and expose it to recreational vessel visits. And we know that they can potentially pick up those species and move them in a, in a far wider context than those operational movements. So you do have to consider those things. Um, as I said, a large majority of those introduced species are shallow water. And therefore, if one of the options is to, to topple in deep water environments where those species cannot survive, then you potentially have, have created a mitigation for that activity. Milton, I guess jumping jumping across oceans um, into California, your your thoughts on this this very broad question uh, based on your research, and you covered off um, on a number of these points at, in your summary summary, um, but positive and negative. So I guess particularly negative, um, given that you covered quite a few of the positives. Um, but what are the what are you seeing as positive and negative influences of structures in the ocean? Well, unfortunately, I, I take a different view, and that is, um, I don't view positive and negative as things that can be answered by science. Those are philosophical questions. And what is positive to one person may not be positive to another. And, and as an example, um, all of these platforms were um, put on mud bottoms. And before the platform was there, there were mud creatures. There was crabs, and there was worms, and there was amphipods, and Everybody was happy on the mud. Well, you put a platform in, it's not mud anymore. So you've, uh, you've killed or removed a whole community of organisms on the footprint of the platform. Now, if you're the kind of person who doesn't like artificial stuff in the ocean or who wants the natural habitat back, 
it doesn't matter how many hundreds of millions of animals are living on a platform, you want the mud back. And so all the science in the world is not gonna change your mind. By the same token, if you're the kind of person who goes like, well, these look like fully functioning reefs, why are we gonna blow them up and haul them you know, to Singapore to be, you know, the, have all their seaweed taken off of them? Well, th th then the, 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 the negatives, quote unquote, don't, they just don't um, occur to that person. And I encounter those people, both of those people all the time. So I, I never talk about positive or negatives unless someone asks me a very specific question. If they ask me a production question and it has to do with a specific species, I can answer that. But I, philosophically, I, I just can't answer positives or negatives unless you were, Andrew, to go like, well, production of fish, platforms, positive or negative? I'd go like, well, if you're talking about reef fish, positive. If you're talking about sand dabs, flatfish, negative. So not a very satisfying answer. That's the reason scientists make really crappy witnesses in courtrooms. They give answers like that. Uh, thanks, Milton. Well, I guess to put Ian in the witness box then, um, Ian, I mean, as, as someone who has undertaken your own research and also sat across the three NDRI projects for some time, I mean, thoughts on this question? Structures yeah. in the yeah. environment, yeah. positive, negative, good, bad, however, however we want to frame it. Yep. Yeah, no, I liked uh, Milton's answer. It's spot on in terms of your perspective and um, what you uh, consider to, should, should we return it back to a natural flat, uh, muddy or sandy bottom? Um, one of the, um, uh, so, and it's, sorry, it directly parallels to the production attraction debate. Does a structure there by providing surface and a, and a surface area that wasn't there before enable an ecosystem that is a flow of carbon from, from photosynthesis through the fishery? Um, is there an ecosystem there that is now was never there before and therefore that can justify um, some of the other activities that can go around decommissioned gear like um, a, a fishery that there's a harvest? Does it, does it match? And so one of the work some of what we've done on the um, Sydney artificial reefs, and I'd love to apply this to say Bass Strait or to the Northwest Shelf, is to actually consider um, how much of the, the fishery is removed and what is the tonnage compared to our estimates of the supply of, of plankton from the coastal currents. And um, it depends, of course, uh, to paraphrase Milton yet again, depends upon uh, the fishery, the species, and the environment. But when these um, artificial reefs are right beside a large urban center and there's ease of access, um, some of our, our acoustically tagged uh, flathead fishes, which is a very popular recreational species um, of Eastern Australia, um, we would lose maybe a third of our tagged fish. Um, and many of the recreational guys would apologetically send back the tags to us. So we knew we had data on um, that harvest in, during January, which is our Christmas uh, post summer holidays. Um, it's almost, I call it a slaughter. So with that in mind, we could find that on, the, on one of the reefs, maybe a third to a half of the harvest could be based upon the supply of currents and the whole the ecosystem and the plume of, of feces and material of the sea floor and the grazing that occurs. But on some of these, you know, we couldn't get past maybe 10%. But then it gets a complicated question because we're looking at um, how these fish spend their entire life around this, this, this small reef. No, of course they don't. These, these, these tagged fish, sometimes they're moving you know, tens of kilometers or so even up to 100 kilometers away from the artificial reef. We know this because there's a large acoustic telemetry array off the east coast of Australia, or at least off the New South Wales coast. Um, so we then realize that um, a bit like the production attraction debate, a bit like the perspective of are these good or bad, um, there's a range of possible answers and outcomes to that question. I think we just need, you know, it's, it's horses for courses. We need to look at the reef, look at the oceanography, look at the intensity of the fishery and the proximity to, to boat ramps and to ports. And then I think you can answer this, this, this seemingly simple question, are they good or bad? 
might I might follow up in with a yeah. potentially controversial question, which I hadn't played with you before. Um, do you think we should be installing more artificial structures? Right. Um, yeah. And and quick, if I, before I answer that 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 curly question, um, don't forget that of course these these this oil and gas infrastructure is already there. It's been there for thirty or forty years. So um, we we sometimes we say are they good or bad? Um, well, sometimes it's perhaps not an answer you'd give to a politician. But like, what are you going to do? Um, you know, you, you can pull it up, but the cost, both environmentally and, and financially, is enormous. So we need to really think about the pragmatic solutions and the, and the reality to, to this. So to answer your question, um, I'll, I'll come straight out and say absolutely yes. Um, I know my dean of science is a very powerful lady. She would say, why would, you, why would you put junk in the ocean and, you know, just leave it as it is, like, you know, the Nancy Reagan, just say no. But um, I find that uh, we are living in an increasingly urbanized environment with increasing amounts of recreational time, with improved technology for GPS and reliability of boats and of weather forecasts, that they're going to be out there. Um, and, the, and the coastal fisheries are absolutely showing signs of a fishing impact, getting smaller sizes of fish, um, which is a, a classic indication of a size selective fishery. So we need to enhance the fishery in some way where the planet currently has uh, 7.6 billion people on it. And in your lifetime, Andrew, I'm not sure about mine, but if we are, we're going to go up to 10 billion and probably level off at a nearly 12 billion people. So we've got to get a lot more basic protein from the ocean, but we've also got to have, um, and in some pockets, increasingly wealthy, sophisticated group that have technology such as boats and knowledge and experience to harvest the coastal ocean. And I see um, decommissioned oil and gas infrastructure for the next one or 200 years will be part of that solution where we will see benefits to production. We will see um, uh, enabling uh, connectivity where uh, fish can feed at natural reefs and, and then move to these new islands on, a, on that was otherwise a muddy continental shelf. Um, in a fairly, you know, in terms of the footprint, it's, it's moderately small compared to the hundreds of square miles of muddy habitat. And yet we are now accessing essentially what is the photosynthesis of the coastal ocean. And that is, um, that's being harvested by the zooplankton and the small fishes, and also by the invertebrates that, that cover the, the structure, which then feeds an ecosystem, which then supplies a fishery to the local um, urban, increasingly urbanized coast. So um, I'm going to come right out and say, yes, we do need more of these structures and we're going to get them. Um, it depends upon the political um, nature of the funding agencies. But right now, with the current state government they have and with the uh, $35 a year license fee that, to go fishing, whether it's in a river or in the coastal ocean, that money is, you know, generates some, some 10 to $13 million a year. And each one of these artificial reefs is about a million bucks each. And the local um, rural communities that depend upon ecotourism, you know, remember that's um, like a $10 billion a year industry alone just for Southern, Southern reefs of Australia. Um, we need to have better facilitation to access that resource and to find better means of, of uh, conserving it. Um, so I don't see um, these artificial reefs or even decommissioned oil and gas as just being um, for to 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 work with an ind with, with a recreational industry, quite a radical idea is to use artificial reefs and and decommission oil and gas as a conservation strategy, where you see this incredible production that Milton showed um, for the Californian reefs. Um, that should be really put to the conservationists as a as a tool as a as a sanctuary zone that provides spillover of of gametes of eggs of larvae to uh, fished areas. So there's tremendous opportunities here. Um, and I, I, as you can probably tell, I'm, I hate to sound like a bit of a zealot, but um, I think we get uh, overwhelmed by the very real concerns um, of um, some, some of the uh, contaminants, the concerns about invasive marine species, about influencing migration of whales and sharks, and, the, and even just the communities. The, 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 you know, the communities that die are seeing on, um, on uh, decommissioned structures is different to, to natural reefs. Um, we shouldn't be 
surprised by that. Um, with the power of, 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 of data that you're getting now, you can apply the statistics and you do find there are differences and they don't converge back to nat natural systems. That's not a bad thing. That just shows that as, as, like an ecosystem that's responding to a new supply of, of, of food, uh, and, and usually derived from plankton. And um, it's going to, um, I think when we get to the certain critical scale, we can address production attraction and where these reefs are good or bad um, is because we, it's, it's a scale dependent question, um, both seasonal scale and a spatial scale. And um, they're, they're tricky questions that can really only be really sorted out by numerical modeling, in my opinion. Thank you very much for that comprehensive answering. Um, just, I guess, circling back to and picking up on some of what Ian, Ian said as well. Um, Dad, coming to you, in terms of what you've seen with invasives on oil and gas structures, what are you? What are the key variables you think that influence uh, the the likelihood of of invasives? Well, um, first of all, I, I need to make it abundantly clear. It, I, I've not spent my life looking at oil and gas platforms. Um, I've spent most of my life actually in, in ports and marinas and, and looking at commercial vessels. And I guess the, the issue with oil and gas platforms is their novel habitats. And um, as much as, as, um, as both Ian and Milton and, and Di have indicated, they are, um, they're a unique benthic habitat, hard, hard benthic habitat in a, a space usually associated with either pelagic or, or soft sediment habitats. So they're, they're novel. Um, if they are settled by, by native species, then they're less likely to get novel introduced species arriving and, and establishing. Um, the risk that they pose in terms of introduced species really is related more to the human activity and less to any unique element of the structure. Yes, there's shallow water and therefore many shallow water species of water being moved. If we think about at the origin of most of the commercial shipping, it's coming out of ports and harbors or um, in shallow water communities. It's associated with those soft or, or um, those benthic habitats that are in the less than 20 meters, less than 50 meters. Um, so it, it, it provides that space to live if you will. Um, but really, if you remove that human activity, then the likelihood of an introduced species arriving by itself and, and colonizing that space is actually very low. Um, and the real question that, that NDRA has asked me to look at is the variance between those, those decommissioning strategies. If we leave it in place, if we topple it over, if we defoul and then take it away, that act of defouling itself will discharge all of that material onto the seafloor or suspend it in the water column as either tycoplankton or as larvae, as gametes. Um, and then the question becomes, well, what, what impact will that have in terms of the likelihood of spread to a habitat that would be sufficient for that species to live? Um, but I think the operational activity, as I said, in, introduces a lot of nutrients to the system, introduces, uh, introduces some contaminants, and many of those introduced species, especially the benthic species, do very well in, in high heavy metal environments. They do very well in high nutrient environments. They do exceedingly well in environments with a, a variety of stressors, um, as most of our ports and harbors are. So I think that's the unique element. Um, everything else, if you look at their native habitat, uh, their, their native environments, they're just another species doing, doing their thing. They just happen to have, have been given the opportunity to come and visit Australia. <laughs> um, Michelle, if I could potentially come to you. I mean, you, you are relatively unique within the NDRI program in that your researchers uh, winding up um, on this question of variables that influence connectivity what in terms of the the work you've undertaken 
Yeah, so Andrew, in our review, we've come across um, quite a few papers that have investigated um, species of marine megafauna that are attracted to, to structures and, um, and they're attracted for a number of reasons. Um, so for seals and seabirds, for example, the structures are used for resting and, um, and, and in fact, not just seabirds or birds, even land birds. Um, but for birds, they're also used for breeding. So, um, I mean, like Chad, I haven't spent uh, any time around these structures, so I don't have a really good idea about, about what they look like. But I assume one of the important variables is, is the accessibility to sort of flat areas where they can haul out on and, and, and where birds can make their nests. So um, I'd consider that an important variable. So, um, you know, the, the types of structures that are, um, the accessible parts of the, the structure and, and, and what their shape is. Um, also, you know, for things like whale sharks, for example, um, here in Australia, we've found they've been attracted, which, and it seems that this attraction has been due to enhanced feeding opportunities. Obviously, these, um, these enhanced ecosystems have high biodiversity, so there might be enhanced opportunities for feeding there. Um, so I guess in summary, you know, the important variable are that uh, variables are that, you know, either resting or breeding or feeding opportunities, that they're all um, examples that are being provided by these structures that are potentially depauperate in the surrounding environment. So in the sea of sand, as, as some people say, um, you know, so, you know, and, and clearly that, it's going to be dependent on, on the, the size and scale and complexity of, of these structures and what the surrounding ecosystem is like. And that's the, thanks, uh, Michelle. That's a good segue. I mean, uh, onto to Dai um, and then might jump to Milton, but Dai, um, structure type. I mean, Milton talked about complex structures um, and the difference between simple structures and complex structures. Um, what, what have you seen in terms of structure complexity influencing um, association? And double barrel question for, for you and Milton, do you think we should be designing for decommissioning? Um, yeah, so, so Milton has already talked quite a bit on uh, the, the complexities of jackets, I suppose, and the various components of them that promote biodiversity and abundance um, over others. Definitely concur with Milton on that. Um, you know, the, the beams near the seabed are particularly important where they have a crevice there that things can get in under, not only for platforms, but also for wells in particular, that flow base on the wells. Um, we get a whole bunch of fish jam-packed under those. And the same for pipelines. Whenever you get a span, uh, you'll, you'll get fish and invertebrates in that span and they will maintain them and um, often make them bigger, I suspect, as well. Um, even, even the field joints in, in pipelines where they have just even a slight crevice. Uh, there was one pipeline we looked at. Whenever we got a crevice, we got a rock lobster. Um, so, you know, there's these clear associations definitely that happen, but there's also... I suppose there's also clear depth zonation differences. I mean, with platforms, you're having pelagic communities intermixed with your benthic and your demersals, um, where they wouldn't otherwise really do that in those ecosystems. Um, and you, like Milton was talking about the deposition of things falling from the surface and collecting around the bottom and forming these big patches um, of habitat on the seabed. We haven't really seen that on the northwest. We don't have that same sort of, we don't have the mussels and that, that sort of community there. I'm not particularly sure for the Bass Strait. I'll have to have another look back at the data to see what we're getting there, but I suspect there's much more um, seabed habitat around the base of those structures than in the northwest. So that's something for us to look at as we're getting into the data analysis now. Um, there's also things like concrete mattresses um, on the pipelines and things that we definitely get a, a boost in abundance around. I find wells quite interesting because they're very they're, they're quite small structures. You know, most are sort of four to eight meters tall. You know, this sort of on the on the seabed, but but even on those, we're seeing a difference between what fish we're getting around the, the tree cap at the top and what we're getting around the bottom and what we're seeing in surrounding areas. So, yeah, definitely strong structural influences on the communities that we see. And die to that second part. I mean looking forward for future developments 
designing for decommissioning a something that should be considered? Um, yeah, I think with knowledge of what promotes the abundance of particular species that might be of importance to fisheries in particular or, or cons conservation significance, if we know what features of structures are important, then they should definitely be incorporated where possible into any new development. But it also could just be for a decommissioning scenario that might topple or um, repurpose the structure into another form, then retaining these sorts of elements that um, boost the abundance of key species in, in the design of those. Or, you know, even as the, the offshore renewable industry kicks off, particularly here in Australia, they should be looking to this as well to say, well, you know, these sorts of parts of our structures might be of benefit to just, yeah, to organisms. Thanks, Di. Milton, glad you switched on your light because you were looking very, very... Uh, I, was, I was kind of looking at there. Dracula there for a moment. <laughs> you were, you definitely were. Um, I mean, Milton, just picking up specifically on Di's last comment, which to me is part of the benefits of the NDRI program, is that it, it does translate to, in large part, across to structures in the ocean, whether that's an oil and gas platform or whether that's a, an offshore wind turbine. I mean, thoughts on the offshore wind sector and, and designing for decommissioning, is this something they should be paying attention to? Well, where our lab, if we, if we want to like drive ourselves into a frenzy, we, we sit around and talk about one of the scenarios for decommissioning. And th there's only two off California. No one's talking about towing the suckers around or whatever. They're either going to be removed or they're going to be cut to about 25 meters below the surface. Those are the two options. Coast Guard says, if you do it 25 meters below, it's not a navigation hazard, la, 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 la. So um, what we're thinking about in, in terms of, of creating like super reefs is to take the top of the jacket, the top 25 meters, and um, just drop it down right next to the to the base of the platform. So all of a sudden you have all this complexity and all this structure. Um, you could put quarry rock. Quarry rock is the favorite um, artificial reef material that California uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife says, if you want an artificial reef, you got to make it out of quarry rock. Okay, so you put a bunch of quarry rock down there and you've got shells, you got quarry rock, you got hidey holes, and, and you've got this huge verticality that may be 300 meters of verticality that are catching larvae, fish larvae, oh my God. So I get excited just thinking, I'm gonna to have to take a cold shower before uh, I go to bed tonight. I am actually, and I took a cold shower just before I came on. So I was nice and clean. So I wasn't like oily looking, um, but uh, I have no idea what I'm talking about now. <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, that's where the, the question of complexity uh, comes in and, and that's highly discussed. I mean, that's something, and it's something that's going to be discussed, I think, in the offshore uh, uh, wind farm kind of thing is you're going to get the same kind of um, uh, organisms attaching to these wind farms and they're going to fall down either through being cleaned or gales and they're going to uh, change the, the benthic habitat and people are going to have to acknowledge that that's going to happen also. But could I ask you, Milton, do you think, though, that you could actually, has there been any question in California to actually install uh, wind generation on uh, old platforms? So, as you can imagine, there have been all kinds of suggestions. Over the past 25, 26 years, people randomly call me up. And uh, so, and the suggestions range from uh, penitentiaries not bad, to uh, high-end brothels, an interesting concept. Uh, that one is kind of weird because as you may or may not know, the only way you can get on a platform either with helicopter or you can take the billy pew, which is basically a net that is dropped onto the deck of a boat and you hold on to the outside and they lift you 14 stories up. It's awful. Oh my God, I sold my clothing the last time I used it. Or you can swing from the, the deck of the boat to the deck of the platform. I'm going like, I just don't see guys in tuxedos and, and top hats swinging 
or you know, it just didn't seem right. So anyway, um, we've had those suggestions and um, renewable energy has come up. The, the issue is that the, the number of turbines you can put up even on a very big platform here is very limited. So the question is, can you produce enough juice in a year to overcome the costs of maintaining the platform? And the conventional wisdom back of the envelope estimate is it costs about $400,000 to maintain a platform, maintain the cathodic protection. You've got to have foghorns. You've got to have lights. You really should have it personed. Um, and right now, the, the sense is no, that, that um, you, you cannot make a profit uh, on the deal. Whether that's literally true, we don't know, but that's certainly the conventional wisdom by the industry itself and by the new renewable industry. It would be great though, if you could repurpose these platforms for something um, other than just like blowing them up and hauling them away, which, which by the way, not only will kill all the animals, but the carbon footprint for, for yanking them up and then hauling them across the Pacific is immense. It's just sinful. So that's, that's a, a segue. No, that's a that's a perfect segue, Milton, because I was going to ask you the question and then come back to the NDRI researchers. We've talked a lot about the value provided by structures in the ocean. You know, if they've been in the ocean for forty years, operating as oil and gas facilities, what you know, what ecosystem benefits we've seen through that. Do you have any comments on decommissioning of these structures and what happens to the ecosystem when we decommission? So the, the, I have to actually get in one editorial remark. I've probably given up a lot of editorial remarks now that I think about it, but one more anyway. And that is this, if you read uh, government papers from all across the world, particularly from Europe and the United States, you read NGO statements there's all this talk about biodiversity, biodiversity, biodiversity. Everybody talks about biodiversity. But then when you go like, well, how about the organisms living on an oil platform? These same organizations either go like, screw them, or they're silent. And that's just not right. I mean, that's the most typical critical thing I can think of. So um, that's one big area of decommissioning that I think someone should focus on. It's at, at the very least, environmental groups, governmental agencies should stand up and go like, you know what? The greater good is served by killing all these animals. I can respect that. I may or may not agree with it, but I can respect it. But right now, nobody's talking about that aspect of decommissioning. Is it moral to kill billions of, of animals um, during decommissioning. So that's one thing. The, um, the carbon footprint uh, is only beginning, at least in California, is only beginning to be uh, talked about. And again, that's something that just in the, in the decommissioning process, when you have all these people yelling at each other, and in the United States, usually whoever yells the loudest and pouts the most wins. So I don't know who's gonna do that. But in that process, it has to be brought up that the amount of air pollution and, and just um, fuel that's gonna be spent, all of that has to come out. And we're, we're so far, we're so early in the decommissioning process that I don't know how much of that will, will come out. Thanks, Milton. Um, I, same question, I guess, to the, my Australian colleagues. I mean, Michelle, from, what you, from the work you've done, what have you seen around the impact of decommissioning? And when we talk decommissioning, we are talking topple, full removal, leave in situ. I mean, what do you think the influence of the various decommissioning options is um, on the ecosystem? Um, yeah, so it's a bit of a tricky one because um, unfortunately we don't, what we really need to answer this question is before and after studies, um, which, which we clearly don't have because um, these structures have been in place for a long time. Um, but, you know, we can, we can make, you know, some judgments about what 
might happen considering marine megafauna movement behaviour. And I'm, I'm just going to talk about marine megafauna because that's my area of expertise. Um, so, you know, some marine megafauna show fidelity to foraging areas and migration pathways through time. So, you know, those types of species that might frequent structures, they might have some short term loss of foraging opportunities. Um, but there's also many other species that don't show fidelity to particular sites and they adjust their movement based on the environment. So, so what kind of feeding opportunities they encounter, uh, such as if they encounter an upwelling, uh, for instance, or eddies that might concentrate prey, then they'll adjust their movement and, and take advantage of that prey source. So, you know, given that these processes are really dynamic, <clears throat> it suggests that, the, you know, a lot of these species um, are can adapt to changing conditions. And so, um, yeah, I would suggest that um, many could adapt to decommissioning if, if that was the case as well. Thanks, Michelle. Chad or Di, do you have any comments on, on that question? Um, I suppose, yeah. We can, like Milton said, you're going to if you if you're taking something out, you're basically taking out everything that's come to associate with it. I mean, fish obviously can a lot of fish would swim away, but they're not likely to have any sort of similar surrounding habitat that's that's suitable, particularly um, offshore in these sand dominated areas. So they'll most of them will just get eaten. I'd suspect by larger pelagic species. Some of them will get pulled up with the structure itself. Um, I suppose if you topple it, like you're saying, you're then providing more demersal habitat. So you're providing more seabed habitat uh, that'll promote more of the fishery target species, particularly in the Northwest. Um, moving a pipeline uh, is perhaps it's gonna have a fair amount of impact, I suppose, on the sediment communities and the in-fauna. We do see quite a lot of, we've, we've actually been recording like the uh, the in-fauna around these pipelines as we've been doing the survey, so the number of burrows and the size of burrows and things like that, we see an awful lot, heaps. Um, so obviously pulling out a pipeline would likely influence those communities too, but yeah. Over to you, Chad. Chad, any comments? Sure. Um, I, I guess there are a couple of um, a couple of comments. And Milton, you know, Working with introduced species, of course, I do get the biodiversity argument. Um, you know, your introduced species, who cares? They're just adding to the biodiversity. Um, you know, yeah, true. Um, it does come down to, to that perception and the value sets that we hold as a society. Um, and some of these questions are not fundamentally scientific. They are very philosophical. They are very social and cultural. Um, in this instance, as you said, uh, with, with one decommissioning scenario, you remove it completely. You're removing the habitat, therefore you're removing the, the, the biodiversity associated with that habitat type. Um, if you cut and topple, um, potentially you're, you're removing a portion of that habitat opportunity. Um, and with introduced species, I mean, you know, the reality is um, we can mitigate for the impacts that those cause, um, and we can potentially reduce the number of new species that will arrive. Um, with some decommissioning scenarios, it's, it may actually ameliorate and get rid of those species if they're not already present at, at other places within the system. Um, so I do think that it is a trade-off at this point in time between leave it as is or do a variety of other things. Um, and it's not just a simple discussion about about the science. Chad, I might just stay with you for a moment. We've had one, of the, one question come in on the chat, which is, uh, it seems that a lot of decommissioning research is focused on demonstrating the environmental benefits of leaving property behind. Um, if you could potentially speak to for your research, are you just looking at um, leave in situ or are you also looking at for removal or other decommissioning options. So the the um, the project itself was was presented with a suite of decommissioning scenarios to be tested against. One of the one of them leave it in place. Um, another to to top it 
uh, topple it and leave it in place or top it as, um, as Milton indicated at about a, a 25 um, to 30 millimeter um, uh, top. The other obviously is to take it up and transport it someplace. Um, and the question there is whether you, you defoul that material in situ before you pick it up and you move it, um, or you pick it up, you move it and you defoul it somewhere else. Now, of course, that scenario, that last one of picking it up and taking it elsewhere before you get rid of the species actually will potentially expose the transfer and spread of introduced species, both during the transit as well as during the defouling that, that occurs near shore. And of course, the connectivity project that, that is being undertaken, if you defoul in place, then you're adding this high volume of, of larval, um, larval concentration and tycoplankton into the system that may actually seed downstream quite significantly. Um, so, uh, I mean, I've not done the full risk um, between those various scenarios yet. I'm still collating some of the information, but my gut tells me that a leave in place or topple is likely to be the, the one that poses the least risk of transfer of non-native species to, to natural habitat or to other anthropogenic habitat. Thanks, Chad. I mean, Michelle, same question to you. Scope of your research, when you were when you were on connectivity, um, did you only look at uh, leave in situ decommissioning? Um, no, we looked at a range of options. Um, and I guess, um, you know, might have to throw out a die for this one because, um, you know, a lot of the studies that are out there are, are really in relation to fish by and large. And we, there's only really a few studies that focus on marine megafauna. So, um, yeah, perhaps the, it's a good, good segue to die here. Um, I suppose the research that Michelle and I have been doing uh, in both projects, um, no, it looks at all sorts of decommissioning options, like you mentioned, full removal, um, leaving in situ, toppling, topping, uh, partially removing, uh, or even taking it somewhere else and reefing it. All, all of those are considered and their potential impacts on uh, ecological connectivity across, you know, from larvae, invasives, right up through to megafauna. Yeah. Thanks, Di. And uh, your, how, I guess a further question, your research is a bit of a lighthouse project for NDRI and it's, I guess, the, the work you've been doing has been of interest to both programs, whether it's the material degradation, contaminants work, and also the ecosystem work. How do you think your research will inform some of those future decommissioning um, decisions? Um, well, we have a lot of data, obviously, that can be used um, to make predictions about things. So we're looking to model what um, might occur on particular structures in particular regions. So, uh, but you know, clearly every single structure that you look at will have a slightly different community on it. But like Milton said, you know, there will be some patterns um, across structures, particularly um, more so for more uniform structures like pipelines and flow lines. So I think there are some patterns that we can talk to uh, that will help operators help inform operators for their particular structures in regions. But when it comes down to having accurate data to support different decommissioning scenarios, they're going to need it for their particular structure yeah, as well. Thanks, Di. Um, we're, we're nearly out of time. So I just wanted to put one last question to Milton. I think that's probably most appropriate for Milton. Um, Australian infrastructure, particularly pipelines and umbilicals contain quite a lot of plastic and rubber. What consideration is given to the macro microplastics impact on the ecosystem as infrastructure uh, or over time with infrastructure in the ocean in, in the US? That's not my area of expertise. I do know on the, on the Pacific, I mean, well, everybody and their, their dog is 
writing about microplastics. And in fact, in the Bulletin of Marine Pollution, there was a paper six months ago saying, maybe we've had enough papers about microplastics. So uh, I don't know of any paper that specifically looks at the uh, effects of, of those materials on platforms uh, it, getting into marine life. I mean, there's plenty of papers, but I, I think part of the problem is it's very hard to figure out where something comes from when you find it in an anchovy. And um, so I, this is what happens when you get a PhD. You think you can talk about any damn thing you want and, and make it sound like you know what you're talking about. This is as far as I can go. I'm old. Well. I'm well. I'm well. Well. I have nothing to prove anymore. I don't know the answer, kiddo. I'm sorry. Mea culpa. <laughs> Um, Ian, did you have any comments on that? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, uh, Andrew. Well, I was nodding my head because I think uh, we've been skirting around. We, we can see the conspicuousness of a, of a, of a platform and a, and, a, and a jacket because it extends by the seafloor. But I think it's those pipelines and those umbilicals that are the real um, concern. Um, and yes, uh, there's an enormous amount of plastic and microplastic work study that's been going on. I, I think... Um, I'm really interested to see what the next uh, session has, but um, I, I just feel that this morning's discussion has been great, but we uh, haven't really considered the, you know, well, apart from um, some of Dyes and Milton's uh, comments about uh, what happens under you know, the spans that go over the pipeline that go over, that's enormously important for flat, um, muddy substrates and what was done um, up on the Northwest Shelf when they, you know, the, 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 the pair trawling removed all the benthos. And now you can see from some of Dye's work and, and Todd Bond's um, recent papers showing you the growth of, of corals on the pipelines that were perhaps the incipient to, to, to then reestablish that, um, that, that sort of Luke Janet snapper type uh, habitat is, is extraordinary. But um, the plastics that come with that uh, is the thing that really spooks me. And I think Milton gave a very uh, concise answer saying, we just don't know what is the, what's the breakdown rate of that material? Does it um, then accumulate in the sediments and, and disappear in, 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 into the local geology of the area? Or does it get brought up and goes into the food chain into those very snapper and lugenids that we would like to consume and catch? Um, we really don't know that. I, I, but for me, from this whole program, um, I think that's the one that I am, um, if, if I have any concerns, that's the one that really does keep me awake at night is, is are those rubbers and plastics that adhere to uh, the pipelines. Thank you, Ian. Um, we've just ticked over time for the panel. Um, so I would just like to acknowledge everyone's contribution. Thank you so much. Milton, Michelle, Di, Chad, and Ian for participating. Milton, thank you for staying on, turning on your lights. Um, it's been fantastic to have you all here as part of this discussion. And I, I hope that those attending understand a bit more about the role of NDRI in informing decommissioning decisions around ecosystem impacts. I'm sure the researchers are comfortable um, with follow-up conversations as appropriate. And if you want to contact Nira, we can essentially facilitate those connections. Um, but for now, we are going to break. Um, for those of us in Perth, it's, it's lunchtime. So we're taking a 28-minute break. We'll be back at 10 past 12 Perth time, which is 10 past 2 Eastern Standard Time. Um, and so look, once again, thank you, everyone, for participating in the panel. And we have another panel following this, at, uh, as I said, in about 27 minutes now. Thank you.